The following program does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Reality Radio 101, its advertisers and sponsors, or its listening audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski, where mind, mood, and what matters to you are discussed. We're broadcasting from Toronto, Ontario on Reality Radio 101. Get ready to talk, email, or post a message to us. We are looking forward to speaking with you or respond to your questions. Dr. Baranowski's work on trauma, relationships, stress, and mood have been featured on television, radio, and print. To contact us, dial 905-725-1907. Toll free anywhere in North America, 1-866-905-7325. Worldwide, 1-866-656-5477. Send us an email right now. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. And now right to your host of the Bear Psychology Radio Show, Dr. Anna Baranowski. Hi, I'm Dr. Anna Baranowski, bearing witness to evolving mind, mood, health, and I am so delighted to speak with you, and I want to say thank you to also Gary for um, being such a great producer and making me laugh before we started the show. I, I know that it's really important for us all to lean towards relationships in life, and sometimes when we've experienced difficult things, we lean away, and we get tense, and we have trouble, and sometimes even when we really adore somebody, we find ourselves in trouble in our relationships, and I want to talk about what's happening in those moments and why we can go from something that feels so positive and so sweet to something that just feels so tense and so frustrating because we've all been through that and we've all had moments where we're really surprised at our own reactions, and that can be really challenging. So I hope that we'll have some time today to discuss and talk with people out there. I know we've already had um, some emails, and um, I hope that we'll have a chance to have a really enjoyable, dynamic conversation today about healthy relationships, because I think they're just the groundwork of how we live our lives. And there's a ton of research on how relationships really support us and can be a buffer to stresses in life. So, you know, I have a a really great experience last evening in which I went out with a group of of friends that I've I've known for quite a while. Um, We've been meeting really regularly and enjoying kind of a game night pretty regularly, which I think is, is, is a really sweet thing to do because sometimes we can take ourselves a little bit too seriously. But we went out um, to celebrate uh, friends, um, you know, uh, big life event. And it just in the getting together and the sweetness in that kind of a connection and how, you know, even if there were stressors during the day, I noticed myself just relaxing into the time because there were really no expectations of that um, time together. And there's something really important about surrounding yourself with people who you kind of know that when you relax and you can just let yourself be yourself, that um, it it just leaves you feeling somehow like you've got a, a, a place where you can just feel supported and at ease. And that just does amazing things to your mind, mood, health. So... 
um, really uh, going back to this whole idea of relationships and, and where we get into trouble and where we actually do well, a lot of it is actually finding people in your life who are a good fit for who you are and what you're trying to create in your life. So if you recognize that you want to um, be more positive, just recognize, just take a moment and ask yourself, who are you surrounding yourself with these days? And are these relationships really serving you? Something really interesting can happen when you actually uh, step back from the relationships with the people you've surrounded yourself with for many years and just be an observer and just notice Um, you know, how did you end up in relationship with these people? Um, Was it at a a point in your life where you felt more um, concerned? Um, Maybe you were stressed. Maybe you didn't feel you had support. Um, Did you choose those friendships based on old patterns, old conditionings? Or did you find yourself very fortunately um, connecting with people who are trying to do the best in their own lives and grow and continue to focus on um, their own evolution and their own um, positive life and their own holding of uh, honesty and integrity? Because I think those are very, very important pieces. I want to actually tell you a little bit about the Great Canadian Giving Challenge that's coming up soon. And for people who know me, they, they understand that um, in the fall of, 28, of 2017, just recently, um, we were very, very fortunate to get our charitable status for the Trauma Practice for Healthy Communities. And coming up very shortly is the Great Canadian Giving Challenge in the month of June. And we're moving towards our uh, donation through a partnership with Canada Helps. So you can actually find the uh, donate page on Canada Helps and just type in canadahelps.org and trauma practice and you will find the trauma practice. Now, what the trauma practice is trying to do is actually support trauma recovery and the, the idea is really building healthy communities. So it fits very well in with our uh, focus today, which is relationships. Because sometimes when we've had trouble in our relationships, it tends towards um, isolation and leaving us feeling just like we want to pull back rather than build that incredible buffer. Um, So with the Trauma Practice for Healthy Communities, we're focused on helping survivors along with their families and friends with a safe place to land through innovative, professionally facilitated programs and resources. The trauma practice aim to promote health by providing individuals who are experiencing some kind of psychological trauma, PTSD, or compassion fatigue. And for people who don't know, compassion fatigue is like a caregiver stress. And that could be for professionals, whether you're a nurse or you're a a firefighter or you're a clinician like myself. You know, sometimes when you're helping people who've experienced trauma, you can experience a real significant setback yourself. Um, So going back to the trauma practice, um, we really focus on access to information and group support programs and educational resources. So the fundraising is really focused this time on uh, group support programming so that we can start offering face-to-face like um, programming that might help, whether it's um, a resiliency and recovery group or whether it's a support talk group um, or maybe it's a group to help you lean towards relationships in a healthy and meaningful way. So we're working on our programming and laying the foundation for that and trauma practice is where we're going making trauma recovery a reality for everyone. Now, I've got a great team who I'm working with, and they tell me that $40 supports one person through a trauma recovery session, and um, there are many giving opportunities on the Canada Helps website, or you can just go to traumapractice.org, and if you have any questions about the trauma practice, um, we'd be also happy to... uh, to talk to you about that. Oh, thank you so much, Hannah. We just got an email from Hannah and she says she loves the show and she couldn't wait for it this month. And I'm just wondering, Hannah, if you're if you're there, if you have a question or um, something that comes to your mind, if there's something that um, you wanted to lean towards in this uh, show and we'd be happy to have a conversation even if it's just by email right now. Um, so that's great. So 
I want to just, um, oh, thank you also to Spring. And Spring says, I'm so glad that you're talking about relationships today. It seems that most of the world is screwed up because of them, bad relationships. Yes, absolutely. You know what? That really is a, a kind of worthwhile thing to contemplate. You know, it's not, I think most people recognize that um, relationships can be really, really difficult. But the problem is, is that we don't want to um, shut down and move completely away from relationships because it tends to create actually an increase in uh, anxiety and stress and depression. So what, what we know from the research now is that we'll have an increase in anxiety, stress, and um, depression um, when we um, start to isolate. So although we may think, oh, well, I'm just not going to engage anymore because I've had a bad experience with relationships, I don't want you to go in that direction because um, although it may seem difficult to find the great um, skills to choose well and to uh, work through difficulties, and difficulties are, are pretty normal in every relationship. I mean, a piece of the difficulty is us telling ourselves, oh, this is not okay, and, you know, I shouldn't be getting in an argument over this little thing, or what's wrong with that person, or what's wrong with me. So more about that is that the place to sit is to recognize that it is our own resistance to leaning towards further accepting and understanding our own inner reactivity around moments when we're relating to others that are not working well. And that can create a whole backlash. So we don't want to have any relationships and it creates all this isolation and loneliness. And loneliness can be such a gateway to depression, anxiety, and stress. So it's more about noticing that we can choose better we can choose what serves us better. We can find ways of coming together with people that is more meaningful, um, focused on, you know, life unfolding that feels more true to who we are, you know, whether it is you're learning about, you know, kind of um, how to lift weights or, you know, what, what it means to, you know, uh, play a new game, or I'm talking about very lighthearted things, because sometimes, you know, that could be a wonderful way to, to connect with people um, without the goal of some big overarching task that needs to be completed. Um, you know, joining a bowling club, a book club, uh, you know, getting together with people where there's a, a component of socialization without the high level of demand or stress. I want to go back to what you were saying, Spring, um, this idea that relationships are, are, are bad and that most of the world is screwed up because of them. And, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm very aware of is that the past pours into the present. So what that means is we all come from a family of origin. We all have our own historical experiences. But there's also generations that come before our, our parents, our own, and maybe the kids that you have and your grandkids. And the thing to be aware of is that if we only just go back one generation, we can see that what we learned growing up has conditioned us to be the people that we are today. But that means what was the relationship like with your parents? What did you learn from them? Um, how did you feel being in their presence? You know, was, was it a difficult relationship? Did you find yourself feeling known and understood? Or did you feel kind of unknown, uh, afraid, uncertain, um, like you were always on edge? You know, these are important things because those things are the things that you bring into your own adult relationships. So sometimes if we grow up believing that somehow in our family of origin, let's say, or the experiences that we had when we were younger, left us feeling like we are not um, worthy of kind treatment. We will take that into our adult relationships. And sometimes we can walk into um, social settings or workplaces with a really bad feeling inside of ourselves, like feeling like somehow people might notice that 
we don't feel so good about ourselves or we don't feel worthy of kind treatment. And it, it kind of has a ripple effect all around us. So we want to actually just notice what are we carrying with us? What beliefs are we carrying with us? Because a lot of that is conditioning. It's not necessarily truth at all. I mean, we may be lovely people who are, you know, just going through life and trying to do our best. And yet we're carrying this terrible burden on our shoulders of old beliefs and conditioning. And those thoughts just keep going over and over and over and over again, giving us huge trouble and struggle. Uh, Hi, uh, I think that's Dawn. Um, And if I've pronounced it incorrectly, I'm so sorry. Um, Dawn is saying, hi, doctor, love your show. Question, I was seeing a doctor for marriage therapy. Great. Um, The sessions seem to be always comprising with each other. Oh, sorry, compromising with each other as per my practitioner's advice. So I guess a lot of information about you got to compromise in this way or that way. Why do professionals not really nip the problem in the bud? (laughs) Great. My husband was an alcoholic and my therapist wanted us to work it out in compromise. Wow. Okay. So that is a huge question. Now, I mean, really when... When I do, and I do a lot of couples therapy, I love doing couples therapy because I love actually helping people get to a place where they can, um, in a really respectful way, attend to each other. And I have, I'm going to just tell you about one of my favorite exercises. Um, I don't know if you're still with your husband or not. Um, it, it, it sounds like that's an uncertain dawn. So if you want to, uh, reply back while I'm speaking so we can have a, um, a dialogue, that would be helpful. Um, so y- you can send another email if I'm off track with this, but so one of the favorite exercises that I, that I use is called feeling heard and understood. Now this is not a way to just get somebody to accept, okay, well, you know, you're drinking or, you know, whatever bad behavior might be going on because the reality is we have to have discernment. And if something is happening in our relationship, which is really unhealthy or truly is not, you know, going to work in the long run, it has to be addressed directly. Otherwise, you know, we're, we're just creating a terrible cycle of bad behavior or unhealthy pathways just being supported and you don't necessarily just want to help your husband be a, an alcoholic by you know not addressing that issue very directly if especially if it's a real problem um, you know what is it that keeps him in that place you know what has happened to your husband that you know he is turning to alcohol um, you know and here it, it, it may be actually for him also history that is leading him to struggle and turn to alcohol. You know, a lot of addictions are really self-medication. People are suffering. You know, what's that suffering about? You know, has he learned that it's okay to have a different outlet for his struggles rather than just turning to a substance? Um, You know, and what kind of impact has the alcoholism had on your relationship? Like, I would be very interested in all of those uh, questions, but here's the here's the strategy that I love working with. It's called feel heard and understood, and it's a relationship mastery technique. And I've been using it f- for uh, well over 15 years. And um, actually, what we can do is we can um, post that, um, and we'll have a link um, that will be available if you want to uh, get it from Gary after the show. And you would need to actually email in studio 101 at gmail.com and if anybody is interested in the feel heard and understood uh, relationship mastery technique we'll get that posted for you there is a link I just don't have it right now Um, so the rules of conduct speak about yourself and your own feelings do not blame limit your comment to seven to ten words Identify a topic to discuss before beginning the exercise or use when you're discussing a topic that's spiraling out of control. And oh my goodness, relationships can get so hot when you're talking about something that is really a struggle in the relationship. And then the next rule is keep the focus of discussion on the topic of related to 
and related to the topic of resolution, um, you know, staying out of escalation. So I want to walk you through it a little bit because, you know, you can play with this a little bit if you can get um, your spouse or partner or a friend or whoever you're working on a hot topic with um, to work on this strategy. And it is really powerful. So in this situation, um, there'd be one speaker. You'd, you'd always start with somebody who is arranged to speak first about the topic you've both agreed on. So maybe, uh, Don, in your case, if you're still with your spouse, you might want to say, I know that this alcohol thing is a huge issue, and um, um, can we have a conversation about it and use this technique? And so, Don, you might want to say something about it. I don't know. Maybe you'd want to say, I... I feel sad and troubled that you drink so much. And then if your husband was up to the to the task or uh, up to working on this technique, then as the listener, his job would really be to work hard to hear your words and understand what you were expressing. N- and Don, you wouldn't have more than seven to ten words. That would be it. Um, so once your husband says, you know, what they think, what he thinks he has heard, um, he might say, okay, uh, Don, let me see. It sounds like you're telling me that it is um, upsetting to you that I'm drinking so much and you're worried about it. And, and then he would say, did I hear and understand you correctly? So there's some uh, words and phrases that um, you want to template for so that you can both reference them and keep on track. Um, and so then, Don, if you said, yes, that was correct, You'd return to the beginning um, and switch roles. But if you said no, if he didn't capture it correctly, you would just repeat your statement as best as you can, keeping to seven to ten words. This is really, really an important piece um, because then, you know, you can actually go through an exercise where you really, really do feel heard and understood. And what I have to say is that, you know, even people in really loving and great relationships can um, get stuck at times. Maybe you're hungry, maybe you're tired, maybe you've had a busy and stressful day and you can get off track. And I don't want you to blame yourself if you're finding yourself escalating, but know that there are ways in which you can move towards connection. So when you say, Don, why do professionals not really nip the problem in the bud? A lot of it is about being super precise in language, um, holding the space so that, in fact, you you can keep things on track, getting permission, particularly the clinician has to get permission to say, you know, is it okay if I interrupt you to keep you on track as we're going through this exercise, if you were working with a clinician um, on an exercise like this and it, it, it is a really powerful thing to do so if people are interested in one access to this feel heard and understand understood technique I'm so happy to share it and I think it would be really great um, you know if you want to play with it or if you want to you know bring it to a clinician and say you know I'd like to try this out uh, and um, and this is you know the topic that I want to work on um, and it might be a really interesting thing to do Oh, hi, Bob. How are you doing? Thank you for writing in. Um, Bob says, hello. Can you honestly tell me what you think of the Dr. Phil show and his advice? He also seems to compromise people's problems instead of really telling the person who's wrong that they need to change their habits or behavior. And that is why a lot of folks will not see therapists. They feel like they're not getting anywhere with therapy. Wow. Okay, so... um, (laughs) I honestly cannot um, comment about the Dr. Phil show. I'm not a big TV watcher, so uh, it would be not really a good thing for me to uh, comment too much because I um, I don't really know um, his show too well. Um, but I do know that, for me anyways, any opportunity to um, discuss um, mental health um, to look at issues that people are not talking about, I'm really in support of because I think there's so much silence in our world. I think there's so much of an expectation that people have to carry the burden of what they have lived through all on their own. And I think that's a, I think that's a really tough thing. Um, in terms of telling people um, what's wrong and that they need to change their 
habits or behaviors. In terms of therapy, and I've been working with people for a long, long time, um, if, if, if I see, uh, if I understand that, you know, uh, something's wrong, I might give my opinion about something. But the truth is that my opinion is actually quite meaningless when it comes to working with within deeper therapy processes. Because if you pay attention and you lean deeply towards yourself, Bob, you will know that you already have much of your own answers about what is right or wrong about your own behavior habits. And that you will also understand that change, real change, takes courage, motivation, and discipline. And it is very, very difficult to achieve. So if I say, let's say, uh, let's say I was talking to, to Don and her husband, and I said to um, Don's husband, oh, um, by the way, you have to stop drinking all that alcohol because it's just not good for you. <laughs> he already knows that. He already knows that. And he probably even beats himself up at, on occasion um, because he probably, there are probably times when he doesn't like his own behavior. So, you know, the place of growth, from my experience, usually comes when we develop a relationship with our own emotion because emotion is your own intelligent guidance system. It's just so powerful. If you can learn to have a kind relationship with your own emotion, your whole life expands because all of a sudden you're not giving yourself grief about the things that you do. You're just leaning towards it with some kindness, with some compassion towards yourself. So, you know, I cannot speak to, you know, a lot of therapists and their approaches, but for me, I've seen the most profound change when people get to a place where they're willing to feel what it feels like regardless of the uh, emotion that is arising because emotion comes and goes, you know, and thoughts come and go. We want to be able to actually have a very uh, respectful relationship within ourselves and around our own emotional content, you know, um, and, and that, that is a big, big piece of learning, um, regardless of whether it's the therapist learning how to do that or it's the, the client or, um, you know, somebody who's just trying to know who they are. You know, pay attention and ask yourself, wow, why is it that I feel this feeling so powerfully, you know, why is it that I walked into that room and all of a sudden I saw that person and they were looking at me a certain way and then I got triggered and I felt so much anxiety and stress and sadness or depression or fear, or whatever it is. And in that moment, if you can just stop, just stop. Notice with a lot of kindness towards yourself, what is this powerful emotion about? Let me just feel it and be gentle with myself. Wow. Then things start to change. So um, if you have any other questions, Bob, I'd be really happy to talk with you some more. Send an email or share with us a little bit more if there's anything in your mind. But thanks for um, raising that question. Um, I, think, I think not seeing therapists you know, when you feel that you could benefit, I think a lot of that is actually generated by some fear as well. Because, you know, uh, I believe it's pretty common for people to recognize that if you're going to talk to a therapist, you're going to start massaging some of the content where you feel anxious, upset, uncertain, you might have a trauma in your background, um, experiences that didn't go well. You may feel a great degree of shame and discomfort. The one thing that I will say is I do encourage people to find um, great therapists. And if you believe that the person you're not working with is not a good fit for you, then move on. Find somebody who you can connect with 
who you feel is respectful. Um, one of the things that I have really come to believe in um, years of doing uh, individual therapy, uh, talking to groups, is that, you know, we, we can form um, a kind of a new way of relating. If that therapeutic relationship is very, very healthy, it's supportive, and it's teaching us how to move forward in meaningful ways in our life, to understand ourselves better, to work through any trauma we may have experienced, then um, I think what can happen is that you start to actually take what you've learned in your th therapy session and um, and actually um, kind of use those new skills as you relate to um, the people in your life. And that can be incredible, especially if you've had a very um, good example of a healthy relationship um, therapeutically therapeutically it can actually be like a reparenting experience in and, which and dr anna we do have a phone call okay uh, about okay so i believe carl are you there yes i am go ahead carl you're live on the air with dr anna mm, fantastic hey hi carl hi. how are you hi oh huh. fantastic really enjoying your show oh good i'm so glad you're calling what's what's going on carl Ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so first of all, it's been several, several years since I've been in a relationship. Mm. Uh, actually, I'll be just straightforward, honest. It's been 20 years. Mm. And I have been extremely shy and uh, introverted most of my life. And the last relationship I had... Um, was perhaps more traumatic than I had realized. I had met um, this ex-girlfriend at an athletic club, and I saw her with another guy. And I remember driving home, crying, and, and it's just as much pain as when I had lost my mom years ago. I remember that pain. In these years, I thought I was open to having relationships but I've had this ongoing belief in my head that women aren't attracted to me and that I get rejected. And the sense of neediness has been in there a little bit, like, oh, please like me. So with that all being said, uh, for five months I have been seeing this wonderful woman, an old friend who we reconnected recently, and it was off to an amazing start. And I found myself really open and present. But I come to find out that she, too, has been through some trauma. Uh, actually, a lot of trauma. And shows lots of signs of it. For example, when I would go to hug her, she would flinch. And she didn't even realize it. Two other things is when I would um, show signs of affection, like hold her hand, give her a hug, there would be this, she wasn't really there. But then other times, she was really affectionate. Uh, when she, especially when she's had like a couple of drinks and she would loosen up. But it would go back and forth. Cold, hot, intimate, then just friends. And it was very confusing for me. We've had some discussions. And now, for the past month, I told her that I would step back, take it easy, have no expectations. And that's been going pretty well. But it is definitely triggering the old conversation, see, women don't like me and I'm rejected and that's it. Mm. Wow. That, that is, that is a lot, Carl. Um, first of all, congratulations on, um, you know, whatever you've done to allow yourself to, um, make this phone call. I just really honor that. I want you to know that I think that is like very beautiful because somehow you must have found inside of 
yourself a way to change the internal dialogue. It's kind of what I was uh, talking about today. You must have made a change inside of your own internal dialogue to some degree so that um, I'm needy, please don't like me, isn't driving the whole bus. So, um, yes, okay, so just... Just before we go on to this disengagement, the vacillation, your uh, girlfriend's or um, own trauma history, please tell me and whoever's listening how you made that shift because, you see, it has to start with that first, Carl. All the other stuff and whether you stay with this particular woman or not of the last five months The most profound thing you're telling me right now is inside of you something shifted enough to allow you after 20 years to reclaim your capacity to engage in a a direct personal relationship. That's profound. What did you do? Yes. So one of the weird, quote-unquote, gifts, I think, of being single for so long is that I slowly over time have gotten a sense of having a relationship with myself and providing what I was looking for outside of myself in a relationship, providing that for myself, and also learning how to have a better relationship with myself so I'm like my own best friend and I try to be as encouraging as I possibly can for myself. And any time I hear my mind give me the old negative crap, I say, thank you for sharing. I hear you. And I move on, and then I replace it with a more loving feeling and or thought. Oh. Oh, you're just making my day. I'm so glad you called in, Carl. <laughs> It's so sweet. Mm. It's such a sweet thing to hear, Carl, because this is where real growth comes from. What you're sharing right now, that's where it has to start. It's like, oh, my goodness, it's like an evolution towards our own truth. And so why can we not start with learn to improve to be learn to improve our own inner language? Provide yourself with what you need. Be your best friend. Why not? And I yeah. love what you said. Thank you. So if something negative comes up, thank you for sharing. I love you. It's like it's a beautiful way to integrate the places of pain that live with inside of ourselves. And why are we not able to do that? Why not? Why can't we all who, you know, all of us who are listening just do that? Gary, would you like to do that? I would. You would too, right? I mean, me too. Sometimes, you know, it, you know, there there could be something negative that comes up or an interaction that doesn't go well and it's like, "Wow. You know, I I like that. I like that, Carl. That's beautiful." Riley just um wrote in and said, "Wow, very interesting show. Thank you." So, I think that's in response to you, Carl. You're you're amazing. Okay, let me go back to some of the things you said because these are all very, very important. One, um, you lost your mom, um, and that's a historical trigger for you. I heard the sound of the pain in your voice as you said that, and I'm sorry about that, Carl, because it sounds like that was very tough. And then the next piece is whatever happened in that relationship that was traumatic, seeing that woman with another man and just closing the door to all of that. I am not going to face this pain anymore. I'm shutting that door down. And that's what a lot of us will do because the pain is so intense. Yeah, and I didn't even realize I was doing that. I thought I was open, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't, I guess. How did you realize you were not? Uh, I think it, over the years, I kind of figured it out like just maybe I'm not open and because I realized that in relating with this woman in my life now I did detect like this little bit of neediness coming up from time to time and it got me thinking like hmm if I'm coming from there well I may think I'm open but I'm not in effect Mm -hmm. 
I want to say something about this thing that you're calling neediness, okay? Because from my perspective, the fact that you need to be or you have a desire to be or a longing to be in relationship is actually a healthy thing, okay? Yes. Like, And it's also biologically wired that, you know, you you would normally, um, you know, we're all, you know, historically like tribe, right? So, you know, when we don't have that sense of community connectedness around yeah. us, it, that's not healthy for most of us. Yes, it, right. And I'll tell you what, the neediness is bigger picture than uh, only with women. Mm-hmm. I used to call myself a cave dweller. Mm -hmm. I spent 98% of my time by myself. Mm -hmm. And I do work in front of the computer. Mm -hmm. And when my clients would say, hey, I can't see you on webcam, I would actually lie and say, oh, it doesn't work because I just didn't want to be seen. Wow. So I have taken some major steps to being more visible, Mm -hmm. getting out more. Mm -hmm. And the overall neediness of, Wanting to be approved and liked by people in general, I think that is what's driven so much of this, and I've been making shifts in that department overall. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Okay. So I'm going to say a couple of things about this, and then we're we're going to wrap up you and I. Um, but so so you've got five months with this woman you describe her as wonderful. Um, she has a huge trauma history, um, and she has moments of reactivity. So I would really just allow her to do what I've been suggesting today and also what you are suggesting. Wow, I notice that my discomfort when you hug me is surfacing and it is creating so much pain and discomfort for me. And, you know, you are in a place where you understand how profoundly important that is for her to say that out loud, without any shame, but just an opportunity to integrate what is going on for her. This is not about you at all, Carl, that piece. I think you know that. That piece has nothing to do with you, her pain and suffering. But isn't it interesting that you have chosen a woman who has that particular pain and suffering that leads her to to withdraw? Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. In in a way, she's a perfect teacher. Feature yes. for me in a way. Yes. I'm thinking. Yes. So if this is all about you and your growth and evolution, it has nothing to do with her. Her recoiling, withdrawing, every time that that happens is your opportunity to say, huh, what is the pain and suffering inside of me that gets evoked in this moment? Isn't it interesting that I have chosen this woman who has this tendency? You know, and the bigger thing, and I really, really believe that relationships can be incredibly important, therapeutic, healing, helpful in so many different ways. Um, So, you know, carry on and enjoy it, but also recognize that five months in and as you're going through this with her and noticing her affection and vacillation, affection and vacillation, her uncertainty, recognize it through your own this is through your own lens. You do not have to stay in this relationship if in the long run it does not serve you. Now that you yeah. have your own new inner conditioning, it can shift everything. I'm going to make a recommendation of a couple of books as well and a couple of videos, okay? I've done okay, a few great. interviews with a woman called uh, Dr. Janice Webb. She's written two books. One is called Running on Empty, Overcome um, Overcome Your Childhood Emotional Neglect. Some of the things that you said about this wonderful woman you're dating um, just made me think about that. And also there may be something in your own history that has created an inner uh, languaging and belief about yourself. To the, be sure. Okay. So my instincts, I try to listen to my instincts. They tend to be very helpful. Um, the other piece is um, is a uh, is the next book called Running on Empty No More, Transforming Your Relationships with Your Partner, right? Your Parents and Your Children. Now, like I said, there's two videos. 
Uh, actually, there's three videos with uh, John East Webb, um, but this one, the more recent book, is the one where you transform your relationships with your partner, your parents, and your children. You know, sometimes I think it's a really nice thing to read a book with your loved one. So you Mm -hmm. might want to get a copy of this book um, or watch the videos with her and just see if you can see yourself, um, you know, how your history may have shaped you into the person that's having a relationship, you know, together at this time. And the one thing that Janice does, and she does a really, really interesting job of it, is she 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 um, she reflects on several different types of parents and how that parenting style um, might have impacted the children and given them certain messages. And I'm just going to read the three types of emotionally neglectful parents. Um, type one is well-meaning but neglect themselves. So you know they're permissive, workaholics, achievement oriented and perfectionistic Um, and you know they'll create some pretty um, tough things in relationships with children Um, the next one is type two the struggling parents these are people who have maybe a special needs family member they're bereaved divorced or widowed Um, they are depressed Um, they are just really they're suffering Um, Type 3 is self-involved, narcissistic, authoritarian, addicted, or sociopathic. So it's like when you have this kind of history, um, it it completely has an impact on how you um, see yourself, the conditioning you have, and the the kind of relationships you gravitate towards or develop or the patterns and struggles you might find yourself in. Carl, I cannot thank you enough for this uh, call. It was a delight and a pleasure. I hope we'll get a chance to talk again. Absolutely, and I just have to say I got chills when you suggested uh, reading or watching together. Perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Okay, we have a great comment from Lisa. Good morning. Um, If Anna has time, please, could she briefly discuss the importance of talking about and sharing stories of mental illness as well as what happens, as what stigma is, and why we have to work so hard to eliminate it? Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. That's great. Um, First of all, I think silence uh, creates a tremendous harm, isolation, and a sense of somehow we're wrong. I think people can feel so incredibly lonely with their inner stories and despair. And I guess I, I really wonder you know, who it really serves, you know, um, why we need to be quiet. And often people around us may feel more comfortable if we don't speak to what has happened to us, especially if we have a very difficult personal story. And, um, you know, uh, people, people who know me and know my history understand that I have a massive trauma history I've gone into work with trauma survivors. I've made it my mission because I really believe that it is it, it creates a huge relief of the pain and suffering when we don't feel like we have to carry that burden forever alone. That that burden is something that we can share meaningfully with the people in our lives. Um But I think there really is something important on reflecting on, you know, if you find in your life people don't want you to share your story, they may actually find it very troubling to hear it or encounter it. One of the things that I think um, happens um, in in silencing is that there's a, um, you know, there's a tendency when we look at the people around us and we see their pain and suffering, to really connect and feel our own pain and suffering, our own shame and stigma, our own recoiling from the pain that we feel with inside of ourselves. You know, so, you know, it becomes really important to just allow ourselves to find safe and meaningful places. And I am not interested in walking around and telling everybody everything that ever happened to me and blah, 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 you know, just kind of, you know, you got to know who your audience is. You got to ask yourself, 
in sharing in this way, will it be meaningful for me? Will it be meaningful for the people who are attending? You know, is there some, some benefit to this? And if there is, and it truly feels like it's important for you, then also lean towards the place where you might be holding yourself back and ask yourself if you're, if you're doing that or you're trying to make somebody else feel comfortable. Um, because, you know, as, as we all speak to these issues, I really believe that it lightens the burden for everybody. You know, I, I think as the conversation about trauma has become more and more common, we, we see people kind of putting down that burden and saying, you know what, it's okay. I don't have to carry this all on my own anymore. I'm normal. I'm just part of the larger human community. And, you know, if nothing else, I mean, if you look in the history of human beings, <laughs> there's a lot of trauma so, you know, it would be actually very rare. And I do, I do a lot of um, traumagrams uh, with individuals, um, especially when I'm teaching a program. I will teach people how to do traumagrams. And one of the things that we find, and it could be just a very wa broad um, base of people taking programming, um, that uh, this traumagram you'll see through multiple generations you know, a history of trauma, even if your own upbringing has been great and fine and you've had great relationships, um, just look back a few generations. I mean, most of us come, uh, are here today because our ancestors had um, the capacity to respond to uh, terrible events very quickly. And so that gets embedded in our nervous system. So if you f believe that you're feeling stressed, but you don't know why, or you feel like you had a pretty good life and you still feel like a sense of panic or uh, fear, it may actually be very historical trauma that is pouring through to the present. So keep that in mind. Joyce, thank you so much for your email. Um, she says, that was very heartfelt advice that you gave your caller. I was in a similar place as he was, and I love the advice. Well, thank you so much, Joyce, and I hope that there'll be a time when I can speak with you as well and have a chance to hear a little bit more about your story. So I want to go back to um, relationships again in general and just what happens to us. Oh, um, we have another comment from uh, Frank, and he's uh, curious about where we practice. And um, I'm here in Toronto, in the greater Toronto area, and we do have several websites. And um, Gary will um, uh, send an email back to Frank with that information. Um, and we have a number of clinicians who uh, are trained with me and uh, definitely trained within the trauma practice approach because so much of uh, the work that I do takes a trauma-informed care approach. So I'm always keeping my eye on, you know, what's the historical trauma? You know, where where have you come from? How has that impacted you personally? Um, and, and I think that's really important. So Frank, if you are looking for a therapist and they are not in the um, greater, and you're not in the greater Toronto area, um, you know, one of the things that you might want to do or consider is to go to um, the internet and just search for um, a, the, a local psychological association. I'm a psychologist. There are many therapists that are very excellent, but I'm just going to say about, you know, a psychological background, particularly, um, you know, in terms of uh, psychological associations, they're all over North America, and usually they have referral, um, you know, portals that you can type in, you know, what location are you in? Um, we have uh, connected with an organization called Good Therapy, and they uh, have profiles for therapists all across the U.S. and Canada, uh, and, uh, and they've actually done a really good job of putting those profiles together. Um, but the one thing that I would really, really recommend is that your therapist um, has an affiliation with an organization, an oversight body that or a college um, that uh, supports their practice because you want to work with people who have good training and background. And again, I'm just going to say this piece again. If you find it's not a good connection or you feel on some level that um, this is not serving me, please do listen to your own instincts because 
you know, there are lots of different therapists and sometimes it's a great fit. And sometimes somehow, even if you're a really great therapist or you're a really great client, the fit just doesn't work. And that's totally okay. And just kind of, you know, you don't have to commit to that person. Just move Mm -hmm. on to a place where you feel, you know, this is serving me better. And I feel that I can get the the progress that I need, like, no, it's reasonable to, to, to get progress in therapy. Okay. So I want to just go back one more time to, uh, running on empty no more. And I want to just remind people that we have our website, sorry, our YouTube channel. It's, um, youtube.com forward slash what is PTSD. And I would encourage if people are willing to subscribe because as we increase on our su- subscribers people can find the show the what is ptsd youtube channel much more easily there's over 200 videos and of course there's the johnny's web videos that i think are really excellent i just love her work i maybe i'll get her on the show one day um and her work the one the two are uh books that i reference today are running on empty no more transform your relationships with your partner your parents and your children by John East Webb and Running on Empty, Overcome Your Childhood Emotional mm-hmm. Neglect. Now, um, just finally, I just want to remind people about the trauma practice. If you feel inspired and you want to make a difference and see if you can help um, trauma um, survivors or people who've experienced very historical trauma in the past and you want to you know, support the trauma practice, um, you can actually go to traumapractice.org and there's many different ways to donate and all that money will be going into our um, challenge um, in order to I think it, we're, we're hoping for $10,000 prize which would allow us to really make a difference um, it's a community based programming so any amount counts even if it's uh, $5 Uh, It all goes towards making a difference and building the foundation so that we can actually offer weekly programming in the community. And I'm really excited and hopeful that um, we can make a difference in the community and that um, I uh, am just very grateful for everybody who took the time to either call in or write in. And I just love those emails. They're just so much fun to get when they come up on the screen. Um, And I just want to let everybody know that if there's, um, you know, some question or something that uh, we can do for you after the show, uh, to please let Gary know. And if you're like some of the um, emailers, and you want to email before our next show, um, we will be back in studio and I believe that um, we're back in studio next month and uh, I think the date of our next um, in studio is not it's not going to be a month from now because I am going to be off air for a month so I'm sorry about that but I will be back July the 26th and it's going to be the same time at 12 30 and I am really looking forward to to reconnecting with all of you and I just want to thank everybody as I'm signing off uh, this is Dr. Anna Baranowski bearing witness to evolving mind, mood and health Thank you for listening to the Beer Psychology Radio Show with your host psychologist, author and speaker Dr. Anna Baranowski, where mind, mood, and what matters to you are discussed right here on Reality Radio 101.